Smoke and Shadow Part 1 was pretty solid, but upon further thought, I think this issue sort of has a lot to do if this book is going to turn out any good. While the first set up some interesting points, I'm wary about where they could end up going. Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. We're back with the gang to start things off. Aang's leading a meditation outing? Session? Session seems better. And we even see Iroh in the background with his teapot, meaning that we're at the Jasmine Dragon in Bossing Say. I guess Iroh lets the Air Acolytes gather here, and that's nice, considering what Iroh's grandfather did to that culture. It's cool to see Iroh making an effort to foster its regrowth. Katara and Sokka got up all saddled up, and they're planning to head back to the South Pole for a visit, the first time they've been back there since Episode 2. Seems like even though they ended on a friendly note, Nava did get through to Katara about the South Pole struggling. But hold on, there's a messenger hawk here from the Fire Nation. It's from Zuko, asking for Aang's help. Aang's simply says he needs me here. And then there's this little translation blurb down here explaining what the note actually says. What is this, one of my videos on non-Avatar stuff? Unfortunately for the team's plans, Aang feels honor bound to go and help Zuko. And honestly, a really surprising twist here, Katara and Sokka aren't gonna go with him. They're gonna still go to the South Pole, their dad's expecting them. And honestly, they're not really much help when it comes to spirit world stuff anyway. This will be the first proper planned departure from each other since the end of season two, which you know, you kind of just figured this core trio was so tight knit, they're just gonna go everywhere together from now on. But we're shaking it up a bit, which I like. So we're keeping things going. Literally the next page, Aang is already meeting up with Zuko and the squad in the Fire Nation. Zuko, don't. You're not allowed to say buddy. It's it's weird, man. Zuko reintroduces Aang to Mei. They were in a couple dust-ups in the show. I don't think Mei's name was ever exchanged, but they probably got properly introduced at Zuko's coronation, I would imagine. Aang assumes that this means Mei and Zuko are back together, but meet Kalo, Mei's boyfriend. Oh, that sucks. That's a rough one, Aang. Some might even say that's rough, but Aang is also introduced to Constable Sung, the man leading the investigation on the kidnapping. May goes on to say that Tom Tom was kidnapped last night by the Kamuri Kage. Wait, last night? So Zuko came to help at the end of the last comic in the morning, sent a messenger hawk all the way to Ba Sing Se, and then Aang flew on Appa all the way here from Ba Sing Se? What? It's bright out. How fast are messenger hawks? Did you strap a warp drive to Appa? If I'm to believe this, the flight from Ba Sing Se to the Fire Nation capital is a couple hours at most, meaning that if the gang didn't stop so much in season one, they probably could have made it to the North Pole in like a day. Aang says, this in the episode The Waterbending Scroll. I haven't even started waterbending and we're still weeks away from the North Pole. But reading this, how is that possible? Really weird choice there to make the world seem so small. Like, I don't need much here, just have May say three days ago or something rather than last night. Ukano fights his way into the meeting room, yelling, and immediately scolds May, telling her that this is all her fault. May, of course, if you want to be a real dick about it in a super roundabout way, is the reason her parents split up, but it really does come back to Ukano. That is, if you're not being a dick about it and and you're not going around roundabouts. Ukano insists Tom Tom would have been safe with him, and of course, Tom Tom being captured all comes back to Ukano not being able to overthrow Zuko. So him yelling at Mei here that it's her fault is more projecting on his end. Also, if you're confused as to how Ukano is even here, it was never revealed it was him in the fight last issue. Only Mei figured it out, and she let him go, and clearly never told Zuko or anyone else that it was in fact her father that led that attack. Kalo gets a jab at Ukano, telling him that they were dark spirits, he wouldn't have been any safer with him, and Ukano Ukano very wisely calls him boy here, rather than by his name, since no one in the room knows they should know each other except Mei. But Ukano isn't done, he's really on one today. He turns his ire to Zuko next, saying that he needs to grow a spine, blaming the weakness of Zuko's leadership on why the spirit world is quote, acting up. Aang's like, you don't know anything about the spirit world, that's not- But Ukano goes on to demand a curfew for the capital city, and the tasking of a team to take the spirits down. Which is interesting, one of Ukano's points last chapter was that the people of Yudao don't have control over their own lives anymore, and that Zuko polices his own people too much. But now he's out here demanding curfews. His end and ultimate goal was always the safety of the people of the Fire Nation. But here he does seem to contradict himself on the point I just brought up. Once again, this is like the Ozai talk, where Ozai contradicts himself in the promise, and I still don't know if this is just a character being naturally flawed, or if it's spotty writing. Aang's against the plan, saying that a curfew will just make people more scared, and what do you mean a task force? Then Aang says you can't fight spirits with normal bending? What do you mean normal bending? Remember that time you dummied Wan Chi Tong with some airbending? That seemed to work just fine. What are you talking about? Anyway, Aang says, let's screw our heads on straight here, figure out what's actually going on, and then act. And if we need to go DEFCON 1, we can still do that later. Zuko agrees with Aang and kicks Ukano out, but Ukano yells that Zuko is an imposter on his way out. And Zuko's like, wait, hold up, I recognize that voice. Mei, was your dad trying to kill me a couple weeks ago? And Mei says, I mean, I don't think so. Wow, Mei, now who's keeping secrets? All right, they're not in a relationship, so it's a little different than when Zuko was, but still, this is a big 
big deal to be lying about. Well, time to get down to business. Zuko says he has an idea about where to find out more about the Kamuri Kage, so he and Aang take off. Mei and Kalo have a chat about why Mei is lying like this, and Mei says that her dad was right. Tom Tom probably would have been safer with him. And if she rats him out now, he won't be able to look after Tom Tom from prison after this is all sorted out. This seems strange to me. Last issue, Mei seemed very discerning, very analytical, and above all else, very critical of her father. But now she had one chat with him where he said Zuko pushed you away, and now she's just mentally crushed? I feel like Mei from last chapter would agree with Kalo. If Dark Spirits were out for Tom Tom, it wouldn't matter which house he was living in. On Ukana's way of being escorted off the premises, he continues to have a meltdown about how this totally isn't his fault, and it's all Zuko somehow. This is somewhat of a cool play from Ukano, if he's doing what I think he's doing, actually. Coming in ranting and raving about how Zuko's weak leadership is the reason this is happening, even though he knows the real reason. He's trying to undermine Zuko with this weird spirit psyop from the inside out. Kiyi overhears Ukano ranting and asks what it's about. Some probable foreshadowing here, and Kiyi asking this, and Ukano saying that this is only the beginning. Oh, also, Kiyi still really doesn't like Ursa. That didn't get solved off panel, don't worry about that. Ah, Zuko's brought them to this weird temple place that's over the Dragon Moan Catacombs. We saw this place back in the episode The Avatar and the Fire Lord. Oh man, I really hope we get to go into the Dragon Moan Catacombs. So I get to keep saying the Dragon Moan Catacombs. So we walk in and oh shit, it's Shayu. Long time no see. Refresher here. Shayu was the fire sage that helped Aang at Roku's temple all the way back in season one. Guess he must have got let out of prison after the war. That's nice. He's even been upgraded to Great Sage. I'm sure that's a title thing, unless Zuko is commenting that Shayu is great at being a sage. Anyway, we are going to the Dragon Bone Catacombs, it turns out. And ooh, really nice art. God, I love the Dragon Bone Catacombs. It's so cool. And oh, now they're going down. Oh, hell yeah. So now, surprisingly, we're with the constable from earlier, the one that escorted Ukano out of the meeting. The one that heard Ukano raving about how Tom Tom was only the beginning, and oh god, he was right. The constable's son is being abducted, so the parents try to fight back, but are countered by a very human-looking hand the spirit seems to have. Interesting. It seems the Kamuri Kage may not be spirits after all, but the smoke builds in the room, and when it clears, the Kamuri Kage are gone all the same. The constable's son gone with them. Zuko explains to the Scooby gang here that there's a mural down here in the Dragon Bone Catacombs that shows a bunch of Fire Nation myths and legends. Neat. But a lot of the older stuff seems to be sealed behind this bending door. Oh, cool. You guys know how I love those. Turns out Sozin tried to erase a lot of the Fire Nation's ancient identity to install the new one that he was striving for in his own lifetime. Aang explains the fire blast the dragons and it'll open up concept to Zuko, even though Zuko should be well aware of this concept since he attempted it that one time. Uh, I guess it didn't work though. Meanwhile, Ty Lee and Suki are gossiping while on patrol about reports of more dark spirit attacks and Ursa overhears them and is like, oh god, oh fuck. She's like, Jesus Christ, where's the kid? And no one's like, what? But Ursa quickly finds her sleeping in the other room, safe and sound. The bending door isn't working though, weird. Maybe Zuko's just not good at it. They're also not shooting all four at once, which is weird. Kalo takes a look though, and it turns out the locking mechanism is actually in the dragon's nose. And with four of Mei's throwing knives and a little help lining them up, and a little side eye from Zuko, and Bob's your uncle, easy. Everyone's pretty stoked on Kalo right now, except Zuko, he's over here like, should've let me fire blast it again, I bet I would've got it. Constable Sun goes to meet Ukano and tells him he was right, and it turns out that it wasn't just Sung's kid that was taken tonight. There's been reports of a ton of kidnapping. Shit. Sung tried to find Zuko for help, but couldn't since he's at the Dragon Bone Catacombs. So he says Ukano was right. We need to act. And Ukano says, oh yeah, it's all coming together. We get some low detail looks at some other Fire Lord murals here, which I like a lot. This one's interesting because it's very clearly not Sozin, but it has the comet in his mural, implying that this Fire Lord also used the comet's power to accomplish maybe something great, maybe something horrible. Maybe even Sozin got the idea for using the comet from from this guy. Also, this one over here is cool because this guy looks like a puppet. Zuko says he doesn't recognize any of them because all the history books in the schooling system start at Sozin. Wow, that seems like something as the Fire Lord you should look into correcting Zuko. I don't know, just thinking out loud here. They ponder this drawing of who Zuko thinks is the first Fire Lord, but no time for that. We found some drawings of the Kamuri Kage too. Mei finds a scroll for their story and asks Aang for a light, but Zuko steps in to provide and oh, Zuko, I don't know bro, that's kind of gutsy. Also, it's cleverly drawn to not show Mei's full expression here, so hard to tell how she took the gesture. Anyway, the story goes, long ago in a distant land, I, Aku, the shape-shifting ma- Oh wait, no, that's the wrong script, hold on. 
Okay, here we go. Before the Fire Nation was founded, the islands that make up the Fire Nation fought amongst each other, battling for territory. The greatest warlord of all was named Taz, and every year he demanded a food tribute from all the villages under his rule. One year, a village refused, so as a show of power, and to teach them a lesson, he kidnapped all of the village's children. They were never seen again, and the mothers all died too. It says the mothers all died in sadness, but like, what does that mean? What the, what's the medical diagnosis for that? I was like, Jesus, where was I during all this? Like, past Avatar me, come on. Zuko posits that maybe this took place before the first Avatar, which is an interesting thought. After the mother's deaths, dark, vengeful spirits rose in their place and took to kidnapping children from Taz's encampments as revenge. Taz lost all of his supporters because he was literally haunted, like, actually. And I assume he also, open quotes, died in sadness. Fucking take that, Taz, dumbass. Suddenly there's a weird wisp thing, though, and Aang thinks May summoned it by reading the scroll. Aw, oh, man, it's evil dead all over again. That's not good. Zuko tries to stop Aang from running off and following it, having already seen evil dead, but aw, oh, Aang, it is his boyish charm, there he goes. Sung and Ukano are out policing the citizens of the capital. I guess they enforce this curfew anyway, since Zuko isn't around at the moment. They've even hired a bunch of goons to help them out. They're calling it the Safe Nation Society. Eh, it's got a better ring than the Spirits Friendship Festival, at least. The people of the city don't even seem to believe in the dark spirit nonsense. That is, until a woman shouts out of her window that her kid is being abducted. Okay, hard to, hard to deny that one. Whoa, look at this shot. Guru Hero killed it on the art for this panel. This is like the best panel I think I've seen in these comics. This looks really good. Back with the gang, Aang's followed this weird wisp to this other dragon statue, Kalo and Mei flirting all the while, much to Zuko's displeasure. Another classic dragon nostril lock trick, courtesy of your buddy Kalo, and we're in, to wherever we're going, I guess. Mei sees the slightly darker and danker tunnel, and for some reason feels like going down there is totally out of the question. Okay, weird cutoff point, don't really get that, but Aang's down and asks Kalo to come along to unlock any more dragon noses they might come across. Anything to get Mei and Zuko alone together for a moment, comic? I get it. It starts off awkwardly, and then Zuko mentions the casual fact that he misses Mei, and then Awkward rapidly changes into a shouting match. Mei doesn't see Zuko and her ever getting back together, not even close. But Zuko asks some real insecure shit, like, do you feel the same way about him as you felt about me? Oof, come on Zuko, have some decorum here, Jesus, that's a bad look. Mei says, shut up dude, you broke my heart twice, so no, I don't like him the same way, he likes me way better I bet, and that's how I like it, I ain't getting hurt like that again. Back with Aang, he stumbled upon an actual for real Kamurikage spirit, and they're much more spirit than the ones we've been seeing. The ghosts explain that they haunted the warlords of the Fire Islands until the first ever Fire Lord defeated those warlords and united the nation. Since then, the Kamurikage haven't haunted anyone. Aang's like, then why are you? No, 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 no. We haven't done it since then, Aang. We don't fuck around over here in the physical world anymore. Not at all. Aang's like, oh. So we take off back for the capital, and everyone's brainstorming on the fact that the spirits aren't the Kamurikage. Could they be other similar looking spirits? And May wonders if they're even spirits at all. But that too gets cut short as we hear the police force below chanting about the strength and safety of the nation. I mean, I can see where they're coming from, I guess. I too might also be in a ravenous chanting group if there were ghosts kidnapping kids in my town. Zuko gets the story from Sung and Ukano, and man, Ukano got this real smug look on his face. Ooh, man, that kind of look would bug me. But Aang's like, how did you get these big muscly goons to assemble this? This late at night. Wait, that's a good point, actually, Aang. Why didn't I think of that? Oh, I get it. Maze is annoyed with everyone with this and lays it on pretty thick that she could just oust her dad here pretty easy. But the point is still made. Ukano even successfully thwarted a spirit kidnapping a few minutes ago, but Aang tells them they're probably not spirits. Zuko's like, what the hell? None of this was done by my order. I'm the damn Fire Lord over here. Constable Sung, you're suspended. I can't believe you pulled this shit out here. And there's this panel of the citizens noticing this little fight between them, leading into, oh, here we go, this asshole again, thinking Zuko's over-policing his people. Ukano Kano continues to prattle on about the safety of the nation and Zuko's in action. This is a really weird line that this guy's on. Like, he personally feels so guilty about being kind of the one that caused this that he's acting out like this. But like, at the end of the day, is it super his fault? Like some cursed-ass ghost lady showed up and gave him an impossible task. Is it his fault that he didn't complete an impossible task? Is he acting out like this because he actually wants to act against these terrible spirits? I guess it makes sense since they took his kid, he'd be angry. And I guess he always wanted to undermine Zuko, it's just the spirits gave him a timeline to do it. So he wants to undermine Zuko, but now he's also against the Kamurikage too. Okay, this still makes sense. I just wish he had more to say or do, maybe. I don't know, he's feeling pretty one note at the moment. Aang says that suspending Sung like that was harsh, but I don't know, seemed pretty appropriate to me. Zuko can't let people run his nation out from under him. The lady from earlier who shouted about her kid being stolen shows up, kid in hand, and says, well, hold on, the Safety Dance Nation crew, or whatever they're called, did save my kid. Like, they're not all bad. Even May is over here complaining about how Zuko suspended Sung. What do you 
do you mean? I know you're mad at the guy, but I think that was totally justified. She's going through a lot too, though, with her little brother being kidnapped. I'm just saying Zuko can't get a win out here. May kisses Kalo goodnight, but immediately goes and looks at a picture she has of her and Zuko. And next we hear Kii yell for Zuko. At least she still likes him. He's got that going for him. Kii asks Zuko if she can sleep somewhere else, anywhere else, since Ursa is here. So Zuko says, yeah, sure, I can do that. I'm the king out here. I can do whatever I want. No one seems to remember that. He gets some bonding time in with Kii as she asks about what he did for the day. And he says, ah, uh, nothing. Don't worry about it. Go to bed. But also Zuko's really not thinking here. There's been a series of events where children have been taken from their beds. Shouldn't you have probably left her with Ursa? Seems to me Zuko would have thought of that. Speaking of sleeping children, we joined Tom Tom waking up some kid in a room of other children, the kidnapped children. Oh man, so we get to find out where they went, I guess. Turns out this is Ukano's underground compound, and Ukano knows that all the kids are here. Okay, so with this new lens on the situation, that means Ukano is staging the kidnappings himself, and then using his police force to stop them to show that his force is better at running the country than Zuko is. I guess his part of the plan would be to be loud and shouty about how Zuko sucks and he's great. Yeah, that makes sense. But that also means Ukano is in league with the Kamuri Kage, like that reckoning they mentioned last issue apparently never came because they're friends now. Tom Tom even asks about that, and Ukano says, yeah, no, they're my friends, they're cool. This is a really strange twist. It's a pretty good twist, but it leaves open a lot of explaining to do with how this plan ever came together. Ukano and the fake Kamuri Kage, whoever they are, working in tandem? Zuko's got a lot on his plate here. Not only is his authority as Fire Lord being questioned, but there's been a rash of kidnappings under his rule, and there's a kid sleeping under his roof that he really cares about. So he takes the venting to Suki. The thing is, though, Tom Tom isn't just some kid that got taken. Zuko knows the kid. He's May's little brother, and he feels responsible for not keeping him safe. But wait, there's smoke coming from one of the rooms in the palace, the room that Zuko put Kii to bed in. Even more for Zuko to feel bad about, he literally took Kii out of Ursa's arms to put her here. The Kamuri Kage are finally making their play. Aang meets them in Kii's room, and they all meet the Kamuri Kage on the awning outside the window. Aang and Zuko try to firebend at them, and Zuko I get, but like Aang, couldn't you airbend? I mean, they're literally holding Zuko's sister here, a little safety precaution, maybe? Anyway, Aang gets booted in the stomach, and he's like, ah, that ain't no spirit, no way. The main ghost lady throws the somehow still sleeping Kii to her friend, and they take off. Like, seriously, this kid is still sleeping through all this? Really? Being dragged out of bed and literally being tossed around? Okay, comic, sure, yeah, I bet. She tries to pull their classic smoke bomb vanishing act, but Aang says, haha, not on my watch, dumbass, this is my specialty. Zuko lands a pretty good blow on the ghost lady, and angrily demands to know where his sister and the other kids were taken. Zuko's on some profile picture game here, too? Like, oh man, this guy looks good when he's angry, and I mean, Aang's trying to. But the Kamuri Kage has a trick up her sleeve. She lets fly an insane volley of lightning, sending everyone scattering, and Zuko realizes immediately it's fucking Azula. Okay, so Smoke and Shadow Part 2. It's, uh, it's fine, I think. I don't think it was anything great. The story is still very focused, which I always praise, but at the same time, it feels like it lacks some substance. It's really, really slow. Like, not much at all happens in this issue. Aang and Zuko go to the Dragonbone Catacombs, and Ukano shouts a lot about Zuko not being a good leader, but other than that, there isn't much. Kids get kidnapped, sure, but that's just happening in the background for the most part. It's a driving element to the plot. It's not part of the plot, if that makes sense. I feel like these comics have had a lot of pacing issues in the past, of course, with the promise and the search. Either things moved way too quickly or too slowly, like this one. The rift seemed to really nail it, though. There are so many extended scenes in this of people just standing in place and disagreeing at each other and not getting anywhere. And while there's a place for that, I don't think it should take up the entire comic. The mystery of the Kamuri Kage was fun enough while it lasted, some good intrigue for sure, and even the history lesson was cool, and I'll give the book this, the Azula cliffhanger is a very strong way to end it out. I usually don't end up liking the middle installments of these comics so far, and this one really didn't wow me either. But part threes are up in the air at the moment. There's been more hits than misses, so we'll find out next time. Patreon shoutouts if you want to see two brand new videos from me. You can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Agent Rhino, who is the only person to have a rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and 84% is pretty good if you ask me. Danger Stranger, who has spider sense in a way that they can sense how spiders are feeling, and unsurprisingly, a lot of them are really angry all the time. Gift Mr. Von PTA, who welded Excalibur and Mjolnir together, and I mean, it's a little ugly, sure, but tell me you're not jealous. Omega Fighter, who finally did it. He said the perfect swear, and now he wins all the money from all the swear jars. Sean Martin, who found the real Santa chained up in an abandoned auto body shop in Hoboken of all places. Meaning that the guy that's been doing the Santa gig isn't what he seems to be. Something weird's going on here. Stephanie Riches, who has a license to kill in 45 states, and a license to horribly maim in the other five. Thomas Lautenbach, who has the power of extreme gullibleness, like if you tell him he can fly, he can. Tiago Nascimento, who spends his Thursday nights going to bingo and telekinetically manipulating the boss for him or his team to win every time. It's just like the movie 21 with bingo. 
and telekinesis. Okay, it's not like the movie 21. Tis Just Lee, who wrote a poem so good the Vatican had it destroyed, seeing the inevitability of most of the world switching to a religion based around how good the poem was. Varunda, who out-wrestled a boa constrictor with their hands tied behind their back. And Whitrow, who survived being sucked into a plane's turbine and came out the other side with a $200 haircut. And of course, my god over analyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Andrew Watrett, Alex Rodriguez Flores, Austin Gallup, Daniel Anderson, Devoted 221, Dizzy Payne, Dominic Saint, Distant, Aaron Grace, It's Carton, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Mr. Fries, Nicholas Abbott, Phil, Pogger White, Reese, Rocket Miss, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Super Sniffer, Turt Bobs, and there seems to be some sort of bear face. Next up, let's finish off Smoke and Shadow.